Good morning, everyone. Welcome to BC 103 New Testament Survey. Last class, we studied on the facts of the Gospel of Mark. And today, we will get into a little bit deeper onto the Gospel of Mark. And I would like to make a small correction. When I watched through the video, I realized that I was talking about uh, of, uh, about the, uh, the one of the miracle of Jesus, like where he fed the 5,000 and it's 4,000. By mistake, I said it in the last class, 5,000 and 7,000. Please make that correction. It is 5,000 and 4,000. Thank you. Yeah, I just shared the presentation. Um, yeah, before we could begin with the class, can I request one of us to please lead us in prayer? Can I request Anand, if you can lead us in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this day, Lord. Thank you for the time you have given us, Lord. Lord, we are surrendering the whole class, New Testament class, to you into your hands, Lord. Lord, lead us, Lord. Guide us, Lord. Teach us new things, Lord. I'm surrendering time a moment to your hands. Lord, help her to teach your word, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Anand. I just share the presentation. Please give me a minute while I share the presentation. Everyone can see this, right? Presentation. Okay. So last class, we uh, we started the Gospel of John, which is the which denotes about Jesus as the perfect servant and we also studied about John Mark we studied about John Mark who John Mark was was and um, why was uh, uh, his full name John Mark has full name uh, as we go get into much deeper I would like to ask the class why was the gospel named as jo uh, as uh, Mark and not as John or John Mark. Anyone in the class? Why was the Gospel of Mark named as Mark, whereas uh, John Mark? Mark has been his second name. Why not the Gospel was named by his first name uh, as John or both names, John Mark? Anyone from the class? Anyone, or have you any time thought this question? You had this question. Knowing his full name is John Mark. Why was his second name been considered and not his first name or both names? It was a norm not to mention the author's name. Yes, the author's name was not mentioned. When the author, when he was writing, it was a tradition that they don't mention their name. That's right. But later period, when the scholars put all the Gospels and the books together, when the canon, the council and the canon came together, now they named the books as per the author. They named the book as Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, after their own names, whoever wrote it. Now, when they were naming Okay, it is not like John named his book on himself. I'm talking about the scholars who put the books together, put the gospels together. Why did they consider Mark as this gospel name and not as John or John Mark? Yeah, what I thought was uh, there was um, another disciple, John. So he was close to Jesus. So maybe they put that as John. And then this for Mark, you also mentioned while teaching the uh, meaning is polite. 
So it always describes Jesus as a servant king, a servant here in Mark. So maybe the politeness and the meaning of the Mark, the, uh, the name Mark, I could think of. Thanks, Jekin, for sharing. Yes, it is one of the reasons what Jekin shared was, you know, among many reasons. One could be the reason because when the uh, when they put all the Gospels and the other books together, we already have a Gospel in the name of John. So we cannot name this book as another John or John Mark. But one of the main reasons why this gospel was named as Mark was, we all know who's the audience. Who's the audience? The Romans. Who's the audience for this book? The Romans. Yes, yes, Nina, that's right. So it was common for the Jews of that period to bear a Semitic name, that is a Hebrew name, or we call it as Jewish name, and a Roman name. So John Mark is nothing but a Hebrew name for John is uh, uh, Yohan or Johan, and a Greco Roman name was Mark. So John Mark has two names one is the Jewish name, the first name was the Jewish name, and the second name was Mark. So since this gospel was addressing the Roman world, so the, uh, the canon who put these gospels together, they in Tended because the audience of this gospel was Roman, so they chose the second name to be the book's title. Got it? Because the audience was the Roman, so Mark may be the appropriate name to address this gospel to the Roman audience. So they titled this book as, as Mark, as the gospel of Mark. Well, the scholars say, when we look at the history of this book, the scholars say that this was the Gospel of Mark was the most overlooked of all the other Gospels of the other book because it was regarded as a summary of Matthew's Gospel and Luke. Hence, a very little appeal was given to this book. Maybe another reason for its neglect was that his writing was mostly Peter's preaching. So only in the recent uh, critical discussions, Mark gained its prominence for it to be one among the four Gospels. So the Gospel of Mark is the shortest of the four Gospels, consisting of 16 chapters. So Mark's style is very clear and picturesque. So most of his material is found in Matthew and also the Gospel of Luke. But it's not a reputation because the, it contains many details which is not found in both of these Gospels. So Mark's Gospel begins just like how John uh, starts with the declaration. Even Mark's Gospel starts with the declaration of Christ's divinity, mentioning in Mark chapter 1, verse 1, um, uh, Son of God. As he, mentioned, as he started this Gospel with, Christ's divinity mentioning Son of God. At the end, at the end, not at the uh, 16th chapter, but in 15th chapter, verse 39, we see that the Roman uh, soldier who sees Jesus eye to eye near the cross, he declares, yes, indeed, he is the Son of God. So we see at the starting and at the ending, there's a declaration of Christ's divinity. So, and also, Unlike like John, he does not expand the uh, Gospel of Mark on the doctrine, but he gives a very close review of the Gospel. We also see uh, the writer's intention is to let the wonderful works of Jesus testify of his deity. So let's see how the author is portraying the two clear pictures in this Gospel. Two clear pictures. One, he portrays from from chapter one to chapter nine chapter one to chapter nine he portrays jesus the man of miracles jesus the man of miracles and from chapter 10 to 16 we see that jesus as a suffering servant 
So this book is focusing on these two things of on what Jesus did. As we go through this book, as discussed in the last class, we see that the key word in this gospel is immediate. We see Jesus taking action immediately. Like, let me be your my slides. Okay. Immediately. Immediately is taking actions on certain things. And the main theme of this book is Christ, the uh, tireless servant of God and man. And the key verse is, can we turn to the key verse? Mark chapter 10, verse 45 is the key verse. Mark chapter 10. Can I request one of you to please read? Mark 10, 45. Yes. I have no verse on slide. Yes. For even Any the Son of, of Man. Class? For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Thank you. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Thank you so much. So from this scripture, we understand that Jesus declares that his purpose was to be a ransom for many. He is the perfect redeemer, is it? So this seems more um, in his emphasis on the passion narratives when we look into the chapter 14 and 15. So we see that Mark uh, devotes almost one third of his writing for this very purpose, much more than any other gospel. So when we see in this gospel, we see that Jesus uh, is seen as a redeemer. So we see, uh, so, uh, the author is portraying Jesus of Israel through that, where Jesus would come to free them from the Romans. But then what Jesus did? Yes, indeed, he came to free them, but he, he had a bigger picture in his mind. He, he, he wanted to free them from the death. So here's, uh, that's the reason in, in of chapter 1 to chapter 9, we see that Jesus the man of miracles he shows himself as a man of miracles because totally in the Gospels, complete in all four Gospels, we see that Jesus performs 31 different miracles have been recorded. But, but in the Gospel of Mark, from chapter 1 to 9, we see 19 of them has been recorded. Chapter 1 to 9, 19 of them are recorded. Or when you put together, okay, in the Gospel of Mark itself, you see 20, which is the last one, the resurrection of Jesus would be, if you include that, it will be 20 altogether in the Gospel of Mark. But if you take only this chapter, 1 to 9, you see 19 of them. When you compare to the other Gospels, Gospel of Mark portrays Jesus as a man of miracles, and 19 of them are recorded, which is uh, uh, quite a lot. And 19 of them, uh, uh, start, I mean, he starts with John the Baptist opens the book preparing, uh, <clears throat> where Mark prepares that John the Baptist is preparing the way and baptizing Jesus of which uh, the prophet Malachi had pro prophesied over. And as per our notes, I've listed all the miracles from our notes. I should have put this on the slide. Just give me a minute. Let me quickly add it so that I can go to a minute, please. Sorry, uh, I have missed adding this. I wanted to add this details here. This is from a notes. Give me a minute, please. I quickly put you. You can turn to our notes for these miracles page so that you don't miss, which talks about the miracles of Jesus on your notes. Okay. 
Can anyone tell what's the page number on the PDF? One second, please. Just keep my minute. Yes, I'm almost there. I'm just sharing it with everyone. It's visible, right? You can see the slide. Well, I would like to list out all the 19 miracles of Jesus. That was one of the reasons why I wanted this to be here on the slide. So as I go through, you know the count, you know the miracles, and where exactly in which chapter these miracles are listed. They are also listed for us in a note. So we see that first, you see that eight miracles proves this power over disease we see first starts from the very first chapter chapter 1 verse 31 talks about peter's mother in law being healed do you know peter's about it he had a wife went on ministry with his wife and he had a mother in law at home who had fever and we see how jesus went to peter's house and healed his mother in law and then we see jesus healing the lepers and then the paralyzed man where uh, uh, I also showed this in the last class where Jesus was complete in action, where the paralytic man, they opened the roof and they uh, brought down the paralytic man. And there was another man near the pool of Bethesda. And then we see Jesus in the continuous action much later. Okay, back to our slide where it talks about man with a withered hand was healed, deaf and dumb was healed, the blind man at, uh, uh, at Bethesda was healed. Uh, uh, a woman of blood issue was healed. Bartimaeus was healed. Then we also see five miracles prove his power over the nature. He just didn't have the power over the sickness and disease, but here we see over the nature. We see he, uh, he still the storm, chapter 4, and in chapter 6, we see he fed the 5,000 feeding of 5,000. You see, there was a sermon, the mount, and then he fed the 5,000. The food was multiplied, and he was feeding all the 5,000. Yes. Jesus walking on the sea. And then again, he fe feeding of the 4,000 in chapter 8. <coughs> And then uh, the barren fig tree was cursed and dried the next day when they were walking through it. And later we see the four miracles which prove his power over the demonic forces. 
first we see it happen in Jerusalem and then in Gadarenes and then in Cyro physician, then the demonic son. You also see two miracles being listed, which talks about his power over death. Jairus' daughter raised the resurrection of Christ himself. Resurrection of Christ himself. So from chapter 10 to 16, it tells the story, tells us a story where Jesus also, uh, let me change the slide. So from chapter 10 to 16, the Gospel of Mark, the author shares the story, he shares about how Jesus preaches. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. And he also taught the large crowd of people, like when he said, and he also said, whenever he taught them, or after each and every miracle, you see Jesus warning the people, saying, don't tell anyone. And he, uh, he also taught them, in one of the sermons, he taught them how a new wine cannot be put into the old wine skin. And later part, we also see that Jesus choosing his 12 disciples. Yeah, Jesus chose 12 disciples. They grow in... Uh, 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 and uh, later, the the more and more he preached and he taught and every signs and wonders that Jesus performed, we see that the Gospel of Mark records that he battles with the Pharisees, the people there, while they grew increasingly bitter against Jesus. And because of that, he also shared some of the parables in the way that people can understand and learn. He shared on the sower, uh, sower and the seed, that is when the sower went out to sow. And we also see that he, he also shared out how they rejected Jesus because he is from Nazareth. What good can come from Nazareth that made that statement? And in, uh, at the end, of the miracle section, we see the Gospel of Mark, or those, this book, reaches on its peak, where uh, when Jesus asks his disciples, saying, who do you say I am? Because there were many things coming up. You know, uh, Pharisee says one, scribe say the other, and uh, each of the Jews, whoever believed on Jesus, they said, but here Jesus turns at his disciples, said Peter, maybe. And he says, who do you say I am? And that time we know what Peter said, right? Last class we looked at it. Peter said, you are the Christ, the Messiah. And Jesus told all his disciples. This was not revealed by, but it was revealed by my father. And he went ahead, he went ahead and he started sharing something very personal to the disciples. He said that I would be rejected by the elders, by the chief priests and scribes. And, and he also shared that he would suffer and then die and rise again on the third day. But then, you know what happened? None of the disciples could understand or comprehend the thing what Jesus was trying to share and teach them. So at the end, we see that... Uh, Jesus at the end, uh, he, he tells at least uh, three times through the book about this, uh, how his end would come. But then his disciples were very innocent or they were very scared enough to ask and clarify with Jesus. So teaches, uh, Jesus teaches more to them. Okay, He goes further and he also teaches more in detail to the Jews, to the people. And not the Jews, whoever listened to Jesus, he taught them about uh, different topics on faith, uh, on divorce, uh, on, on how to handle the children, the dangers of loving the rich. And uh, he, uh, riches, it means to say about the wealth, yeah. He, he tells his disciples that uh, the 
the amazing sentence again the key was john 10 45 he talks about uh, just read yeah it talks about for even the son of man did not come to be served but to serve and to give them is uh, to give his life a, a life a ransom for many again and again uh, john would like to quote this book on the serving part of jesus so this is what happens the rest of the book of jesus christ because uh, john sorry john mark or mark portrays jesus as the man of miracles and becoming a suffering servant for people and through 6 11 chapter 11 to 16 this is what happens i'm just narrating this for our understand for our understanding purpose like what happened in the last eight days okay i know seven days makes a week but eight days, that is sunday to sunday this is just for our understanding the scripture does not say like on a sunday this happened on a monday this happened and on a friday jesus was crucified and on a sunday he was resurrected it doesn't put it across that way but then this is what happened the scripture says that on a, on a, uh, um, you know he, he died he was buried he was crucified and he was buried and on the third day he rose again so according to our calendar according to our times I'm just trying to put across for us to have a better understanding okay so on uh, for example on a Sunday Jesus had his disciples get a cloth and he rode into Jerusalem on it while people waved the palm branches and cried out saying, Hosanna, which means God save us. So they accepted him as a king. They gave that special treatment of, you know, covering the road with the cloth and allowing the um, young cold uh, where Jesus was seated on it and walked through the Jerusalem as they entered the Jerusalem. The next day, that's Monday, as Jesus was walking, he looks at the fig tree and he curses the fig tree for not having the fruit. And he opposes the people. Uh, he goes after that. Uh, he enters the temple and he opposes people selling money, uh, changing in the temple. And he says that, uh, don't make my father's house a marketplace. And the next day, Tuesday, they walk back. Uh, the same road and they noticed the fig tree was dry and they saw it as withered and gone away and one of his disciples mentions that look at the tree what happened to which Jesus cursed and Jesus totally owns the Pharisees argument about his authority that he had and during the week he continues to teach and what happened it only irritated the Pharisees because the truth sounded better to them and even he foretells at the destruction of the temple then jesus sat on the mount olives looking at the temple he prophesied to his disciples about the end times and that he would come back that he would come back and on tuesday it, indeed it was a very long day isn't it and the next day next day you see we keep it as Wednesday because we spoke about Tuesday. Wednesday, the Pharisees wanted to arrest Jesus. Judas met with them and they started the procedure. The process was started to arrest Jesus. And on Thursday, Jesus and his disciples began the Passover celebration. It was a very big celebration those days. Just like that night, Last Supper, Yes, it was a customary for the servant of the house to wash the feet at the Last Supper. So they brought in a basin of water to wash all the feet of the guests. So in Judah, why do they wash the feet? Can anyone say from the class, uh, why was it needed? Why was this procedure set those days? They used to walk a lot and uh, the, there sh there'd be a lot of dirt in their feet. That was one reason. And also, like, to honor the guests. So. Exactly. Check in. Thanks. Thanks for answering. Yes. See, Judah, when you see background, we always look at the background, the culture, the place, geographic. See, in Judah, the roads were muddy roads. And it was 
to, it used to get very dusty. Just imagine a bullock had passing there, or uh, you know, uh, and the people constantly walking. There's always this dust rising from the ground. It was very dusty. So if you walk through that, definitely your feet will be dusty. So before they enter into any place, any house, especially when you sit down to have your food, it is a custom. So in those days, it has become a custom to wash the feet. So and it it's the job of the slave to wash their feet. So um, so when it when when they all know it is the job of a slave to wash the feet, now they all have come. Okay, all the disciples with Jesus, they have come into this room to uh, for the uh, for the Passover meal to have a, a Passover meal. When they come, they know they somebody should wash the feet. Now they're looking at each other. Who's going to wash the feet? Who's going to wash the feet? So as they look at each other, obviously Peter being very assertive, aggressive. So he says, "Don't look at me, boys. You know I'm the oldest." And then uh, somebody else in the team says, "Listen, last time I washed it. Okay, so don't look at me." And then uh, this is not there in the gospel. Okay, I'm just making it up for us to understand. And then Thomas would have said that, "Not me." not me, maybe next time. And then we see each of the disciples deny to take their turn, deny to take their turn. And the Bible says that Jesus, knowing their intention and how they feel about all these things, he just came forward. He just came forward and he removed his outer garment and he took a cloth and girded his waist. Girded his, girded on his waist. Immediately, the very act of Jesus shocked the disciples. The very act of Jesus shocked the disciples, and they were in complete silence. In fact, you see, the disciples lost the opportunity of serving. They, in fact, lost the opportunity to serve one another. You see, Jesus, being the Son of God, came from the Father, is going back to the Father. But you see, he stooped down. He can afford to stoop down and serve people. The very action of Jesus, it is definitely an extraordinary act. One of the scholar, his name is John, uh, I, I read this in a commentary where he says, a wife might wash her husband's feet, her children might wash his father's feet, and the disciples might wash the master's feet. But in every case you see, it would be an act of extreme devotion. So foot washing was normally carried out by a servant and not by those who are participating in a meal and certainly not by the one who's proceeding at the meal. So when you look back at the Jewish tradition, a Jewish slave, a Jewish a slave would not be asked to wash people's feet. The task was assigned to a Gentile slave. So it is much lower than that. Dear Jesus, you know, considering him to be that, he just stooped down to that level. So the whole act you see, Jesus did more than to fill the need in that place. He just offered an object lesson to us. He explained that Jesus explained with this example as saying, you know, in John 3.15, he says, let me turn to John, no, not 3, it's 13, yes, please turn to John 13.15, he says, let him who's on the house talk not go down to the house, sorry, sorry, not there, um, you know, a little bit later, he says, you know, do as I have done, just washes the feet, and he says, this as an example, and he says, do it as I so when we look deep in the fact, the very act itself is not the main point, but it's the attitude 
on clouds. So Jesus desires that we will be willing to humble ourselves to serve others in that manner. So he's looking at, you know, he's looking at each of us. Please ignore the pride or the position, or the power that is in you, that is stopping you to stoop down yourself to serve others. He's saying, do it, because I have done it. I've done it. The Son of God, this Gospel of Mark, addresses Jesus as the Son of God. The Son of God can stoop down to that level. How much more you and I are in the And he says, whatever is resisting you, just come out of all that. There's also another book by uh, Charles, uh, sorry, Charles Stanley talks about clean feet and clean heart, he puts it in a very interesting manner. He just says, uh, uh, Jesus performed his greatest and the most humble act in washing the feet. Within 24 hours, <coughs> okay, within 24 hours, the same hand that washed the feet of the disciples will be nailed on the cross. Will be nailed. So the message here is that every task that God gives us, Every task that God gives us. It's very important in his kingdom. We need to we need to understand that there's nothing small, nothing big. So what I'm trying to say, or what is Jesus trying to say? When we put it in our time, when we put it in our time, it says it. Like, you know, uh, the verse says, go now. You don't do as what I do. So he's trying to say that go love people by putting them above ourselves. One of the reasons why the disciples were not able to perform what Jesus did was they thought that they are better, they are higher. Pride, ego, position, power made the person to avoid to put down, to avoid loving each other. This is what Jesus is asking that you would today. Love people. Consider them better than yourself, just like what Paul writes in the letters. Consider others better than us. So through this simple, uh, through this very simple act, we see that the Most High God who took the position of one of the most lowest. Luke also states that the Last Supper, the disciples were bickering, that is debating about who was the greatest. So every one of them would have considered Jesus to be the greatest. But then what happened? The greatest man was a rabbi, was a teacher. He was their Lord, the Messiah, the Son of God. He stood down to that level to wash their feet. And then they go ahead with the dinner part, left Yes. So now they go ahead and have dinner together. So Jesus is breaking the bread and the wine. And he again compares it to his body, what's going to happen in the next few days. And then very soon after that, <clears throat> they go to the Garden of Gethsemane and then we know what happened. Um, you know, there's a Roman governor, Pilate, who sent the soldiers to arrest Jesus because he ascended uh, and as Jesus and then we see uh, he was sentenced to death and crucifixion and on Friday morning around 9 a.m. Jesus was mocked, whipped and at 3 p.m. he was crucified. At that moment, very soon, at that moment, there was no sunlight. It was very painful. It was all covered with darkness. God the Father turned away from his precious son. The son whom God, you know, the voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. But the same God is turning away from his precious son. Why? Because the sin of the world is for there was an eternal, there was a separation. And Jesus could not withstand that separation. He could not withstand that separation from his father. 
as time and again Jesus said that whatever I do, I do what I see my father do. He was so connected in relation with his father now because he's he's carrying the sin of the world in the rim. But you see, sin separates us from God. So now Jesus is separated from God. And that is a very painful thing for Jesus. So in scripture, Matthew 15, Matthew 15, 34. Yeah. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is translated as, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he died. He died after a few words. Just shared a few words, we'll study later of the seven words of the cross. Then he died. Now, what happened? The disciples carried the body of Jesus and laid it into the tomb of Jews. The Matthias came forward, offered the new tomb that he had built. And on Saturday, it's complete silence. Disciples are scared. Sunday, just a week before. Maybe the disciples you know, would be remembering, isn't it? Last week, Sunday, people celebrated him to enter into Jerusalem. They made him sit on a cold, they put that cloth, they welcomed him, cried out with a voice, waving the palms, saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. And now, the same people who are screaming on a Friday saying, Crucify him, crucify him. He's no more. He's dead and gone. He's been laid in a stranger's tomb. It's all the, the, the whole scene may be going into the disciples' mind. Who are walking boldly. You know, Peter walking boldly, saying, Hey, I'm the disciple, I'm the leader. Jesus appointed me. Now, where is he? He's so fearful. Where is the boldness which Peter had? He denied Jesus three times to the cross. And now he's hiding. He's planning to get back to his old business, thinking everything is over. Everything is done and over. And some of Jesus' followers, there is a few women named Mary, there's another Mary, and Salome, went to the tomb of Jesus to anoint the body. And now the God, there's, uh, and there was one who will move that large stone for them. But when they came near, they found the large stone was moved. And there was an angel of a man dressed in white, who was supposed to be an angel. And he told them that Jesus is not him, he's risen, he's alive. And he indeed showed the empty tomb to them. He showed the empty tomb to them and told her to go and tell Peter and all the disciples to go to Galilee and wait there. And just as suddenly as you know, the book ends abruptly, it ends abruptly with this final miracle of Jesus being raised, the man of miracles being raised. So the very act shows us Jesus killed the death itself and made a permanent pathway of life to his father. So verse 16, we also know that some of the scholars added a few verses to give a perfect ending. Okay, that is from verse 15 to verse 20 which talks about the Great Commission. 14 to 20 talks about the Great Commission, that the risen Jesus looks at the disciples and he says, he rebukes first the unbelief and the hardness of the heart, and then he tells them, go into all the world, verse 15, chapter 16, verse 15, he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. 
he who believes and is baptized will be saved, and he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe in my name, in my name. They will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will be it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will so then after the Lord has spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere. So this is what the disciples they, they took the great commission very seriously and they went out they say the lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs and things. Amen. so our recommendation for each of you is to study the gospel of mark as a whole we study through it several times because it's filled with the miracles of jesus Miracles of Jesus. So we will understand the story of Jesus both as man's miracles and as a suffering servant. Both the points we get to understand Jesus was. So with that, that's what the Gospel of Mark is all about. We'll leave you all with this and I will keep it open. If you have anything to share about Gospel of Mark, please go ahead and share because of the time I may not have covered every detail of the miracle parable other events but i just thought i'll take it as a story to share with you if there's anything else please go ahead unmute share or talk about the incident that we covered that has helped you to understand please feel free to unmute and anyone from the team from the class can unmute and share your views Okay, I hope there's nothing. It is easy to understand the gospel of Mark. So with that, we will just pray. We'll pray and we'll ask God, God, give us that servant heart that Jesus carried within himself. Help us to stoop down just like how Jesus stood down and help us to consider others better than ourselves. We'll just pray and ask God because that is not in our hand because we are human. It is the nature of God that can help us to humble ourselves and look up to God and look up to Dear Father, we thank you. Thank you that you died on the cross. Thank you for the art that you performed on me every year, being the Son of God. You humble yourself in every area. You went to humble yourself much lower than the servant. And you washed the feet of Jesus in your each and every disciple. Father, we thank you. Lord, I pray that you will change your heart, our mind, our soul. We pray that, Lord, you will change, uh, you will make it more like you, where we can humble ourselves to do what it takes to do. You will humble ourselves in the way that we will please you in every act that we do. The thought behind the act will be uh, 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 that pleases you, O oh Lord. That way your name will be exalted, O oh Father. Lord, we pray that you will change your heart, where we will consider others better than ourselves. Will we put others' priority, others as the other person as first? Father, we pray and we love you. That you are the most high God. You're the King of Kings. Lord, we thank you that you will change your heart and mind and help us to love each other just the way you intended to be. You will help us to love each other more than us. Put others first. Help us to serve the way you serve. It can only be done. Through you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining in today's session. God bless. See you all tomorrow. Thank you. God bless.
Thank you.